Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we will be discussing Book 7, Chapter 20 of Gardens of the Moon, a novel set in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast is... Ser- <laughs> this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I believe this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. Now, we'll be covering the events in the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those who have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to covering that portion of the respective books, but knowing me and my loud mouth, I'm sure to spoil it for someone by saying something so in advance i'm sorry but i don't really have my usual i'm sorry so i'm sorry that i don't have an i'm sorry to say that i'm sorry so sorry (laughs) you set a precedent (laughs) i did dangerous a sorry precedent (laughs) yes a quick warning today's episode contains descriptions of subjugation and domination (laughs) as well as some non-human violence listener discretion is advised our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we would really appreciate that. Really. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link at our website, horsefrogproductions.com. Also, we would really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right. Chapter 20, part two. Lauren entered a mostly empty Quips bar. As a quick reminder, Quip's Bar is located in the lakefront district with its back to the second tier wall. On the other side of the wall lies the Daru district, and this is where the Phoenix Inn is located, in the Daru district. Right. A disheveled old woman watched Lorne from behind the counter. Lorne saw three men seated at a table against the far wall. They were playing cards and copper coins were visible on the tabletop. The man that had his back against the wall was wearing a scorched leather cap. He met her gaze and gestured to one of the empty chairs. He said, have a seat, adjunct. Join the game. Lauren shrugged to mask her shock and said, I don't gamble, as she sat in the chair. The man was looking at his cards. He said, not what I meant. The man seated to the left of the first said, meant a different game, did Hedge. Lauren turned to see a skinny, short man with massive wrists. She asked his name. He said, Fiddler. The guy losing his coins is Mallet. We've been expecting you. I guess Fiddler's background as a mason could have contributed to building up his wrists. What do you think? It's an interesting way to describe somebody. It it is interesting. I'm a Baptist. We look at the ankles. Sorry, that's a drink. (laughs) That's a a dress length joke. Um, Not the wrist. Not not the elbows? (laughs) Not not the elbows. uh, uh, We'll we'll let the wrist. I'm just kidding. But uh, I am just kidding. But uh, no, when I think of big (laughs) wrists like that, I think of rheumatoid arthritis, dude. I know. That's a weird way to look at someone's Mm thick-wristed. I don't see myself going, dude, did you see that guy had some awfully thick wrists? (laughs) That's not something I normally notice, you know. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah i've never it stuck out to me i've never heard anybody it, it, described as a real thick wristed individual <laughs> right i don't know if it, i'm a, yeah i'm like you yeah, i'm hoping that denotes strength yeah because fiddler i've always pictured him as wiry or if you live in texas wiry right <laughs> i you know i don't know why i've always i've always kind of pictured him as like i've, I've always imagined him and Hedge is kind of like little linebackers, like little kind of shorter, stockier fellows. Oh, really? Not, oh, not I overweight, was... but not not oh, okay. like, but just kind of like not not overweight or nothing, but just kind of shorter, stockier fellows. You know, uh, Fiddler has always been lean to me. Okay. Now Hedge, well, yeah, I, he's a little bit heavier set, but Fiddler was all—he's described as bandy-legged, right? But yes. also, I always just pictured him as thin. Well, and apparently, you're right. <laughs> he's wiry. Wiry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in a dry tone, Lorne said, So I gather. Your intelligence impresses me, gentlemen. Is the sergeant nearby? Fiddler said, Making the rounds. Should be by in ten minutes or so. We've got the back room in this rat trap, right up against the tier wall. Hedge said, Me and Fid dug through that damn wall, seven bloody feet thick at its base. An abandoned house on the Daru side. It's our back door. Lorne said, so you're the saboteurs, and Mallet, a healer, correct? Mallet nodded as he looked at his cards. He asked Fiddler to make the next rule. Fiddler said, Knight of House Dark is the wild card. That's the opening suit, too. 
unless you're holding the Virgin of Death. If you get her, you can open with half ante and double up if you win the round. I honestly don't know how these guys are able to keep up with Fiddler's convoluted rules. I'm always confused with these games as they progress. Isn't that kind of uh, the point? Is just to listen to Fiddler digress with his weird rules, I guess. Yeah, I guess in some ways, particularly when it comes to the behavior of the cards. But when it's all about anning up and half this, double that, I, I get yeah. a little confused, you know. Oh yeah, you just got to trust it. But but so, but there being so no DMing for Fiddler. So no, 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 no dungeon mastering for him. <laughs> I have to think that he might actually be pretty good, <laughs> yeah. but uh, keeping the rules straight, you'd have to trust him implicitly. R right. I right. do know one of my friends who has DM'd in the past, his entire goal is not the amusement of the party, but to crush the party. So <laughs> you don't want that type of no. behavior from your DM, right? So no, I, I, we, I don't we think were... Fiddler would be that way. We were just kind of seat of our pants. It was just kind of generally made up, just you know, mm -hmm. what, whatever we were doing. So it was, you know, it was kind of our thing. But yeah, okay. no, we, we weren't trying to destroy. We're trying to get. You're trying to hurt some folks, but you know, trying to hurt someone pretty. You <laughs> want them to feel that they barely won by the skin of their teeth. Yeah. You yeah. don't want them to roll through it. They do, okay. So it needs to feel. <laughs> For those of you that have never ran a campaign before, the best campaigns are ones where the people that are in the game feel they have the semblance of choice, like they can go where they want. They're not being railroaded down a specific rabbit hole for the story purposes. They can go where they want. They are challenged heavily. They're rewarded heavily, but it, it should not be a cakewalk. Right. You, yeah. you need to let them kill some of those boars in the forest. I'm sorry. That's a World of Warcraft South Park style. But um... <laughs> <laughs> that's the first South Park reference of the night. <laughs> we keep a tab here. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> if, it, if it's going to start costing me, I'll have to really watch it. I didn't say there would be punitive measures. Oh, I just okay, said I was okay. going to keep a tally. You know? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> what like happens that. if I add to the tally? <laughs> <laughs> it's so unexpected when you do it's just you know it, okay. it's not like me who's always expected to, at some point it's like he's fighting against that as, you know because unfortunately as we have all discovered south park has spoken to nearly everything and their attempt yeah. to be insane they were actually quite prophetic in, in several instances and particularly mm -hmm. this uh particularly where we are right now and we'll really leave it at that yes yes <laughs> leave it right yes there. yes Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mallet slapped down the Virgin of Death and tossed a coin into the middle of the table. He said, let's run it through then. Fiddler dealt Hedge another card and said, we ante up now, Hedge. Two coppers apiece and high hood come the Herald of Death. That statement right there, high hood come the Herald of Death. I didn't mm -hmm. understand what he's saying there. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren was amazed they were using a deck of dragons to play the game. She observed a pattern emerging on the tabletop as the game progressed. Fiddler pointed to the Virgin of Death and said, You got the Hound on the Run, Knight of Dark's Close. I can feel it. Mallet groused. But what about this damn Virgin of Death? Fiddler pointed out that she had her teeth pulled and the ropes out of the picture. He then laid down a card and said, and there's the dragon bastard himself, sword all smoking and black as a moonless night. That's what got the hound scampering. Hedge cried, wait a minute, and slapped down a card atop the night of dark. He said, you said the captain of lights rising, right? Fiddler concentrated on the pattern and agreed with Hedge. He said, he's right, Mallet. We pay over two coppers each automatically. That captain's already dancing in the night's shadow. Who is the Captain of Light dancing in Rake's shadow? Do you think it's this person that's been foiling Surratt, or is it Perrin? You know, I'm going to have to think it's the latter. I think it's, I, I think it's going to be Perrin in, as okay. far as in, it's in relation to the plans and overall scheme of things. Captain of Light, though. I've never heard of him referred to as Captain of Light before. That might be a Garden of the Moonism. That could very well be. Because yeah. uh, the the only other captain like you uh, is one that we've mentioned later on down that we'll we'll get to on the Surratt issue. Okay. Yeah. You know. Lauren loudly interrupted. Excuse me. Are you a talent fiddler? Should you be using this deck? Fiddler scowled and said, "It ain't your business, adjunct. <laughs> we've been playing for years. Nobody's tossed a dagger our way. You want in? Just say so. Here, I'll give you your first card." He laid down a card face up before she could respond. Fiddler said, "Now, ain't that odd?" 
throne inverted you owe us all 10 gold each a year's pay for all of us quite a coincidence <laughs> that is pretty bold first telling the adjunct is none of her business then making up a rule that she owes them all a year's pay each definitely not much respect conveyed for her position no 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 not much at all but the uh, quick question something i just now thought about um before i get to my other question I didn't realize how I, you know, I forget how accurate he is in his playing of the game that he comes to the events, mm -hmm. you know, just how much it mirrors exactly what's going on. And, um, but do you think the cards are telling him about the rules or does he just, do you know what I'm saying? Or is he, or is, or is he just making it up? I, th I think some, I, I want to think something's telling him this for some reason. I think it's a bit of both. So I, right. I think when it comes to interpreting the cards, <laughs> he's interpreting the cards in a prophetic manner. But when it comes to the rules, I think he that's coming from inside of him. Okay. Okay. But I mean, that's all conjecture. I, I yeah, that's just the feeling that I have about it. Yeah, because it's weird. I mean, because uh, like I say, I forget how much this is the first time I guess we really see it where you realize it's like, good gracious, they've been doing this all the time. And it's, so he's all, so that's where their intelligence comes from. <laughs> Is it coming from Fed? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> In the case of the intelligence that Lauren is talking about, I think largely at this point, it came from a combination of things, Quick Ben and Perrin. Okay. And do Jack. Okay. What do you think? You know, I, I, I think you're right. It's just probably a little bit of it all, but these it's, it's apparently impossible to keep these fellows out of the know. I think Fit is somehow his talent leads him to be nosy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he, I, when things get serious, they do have Fid do a reading. Yeah, yeah. Head snorted loudly and quipped. Also, happens to be the Empire's guilt coin paid to our kin once we're confirmed dead. Thanks a lot, Fid. Fiddler oh. snapped. Take the coin and shut up. We ain't dead yet. <laughs> Mallet pointed out he was still holding a card. Fiddler rolled his eyes and said, so let's see the damn thing then. Mallet placed the card on the table and Fiddler laughed. He said, Orb, true sight and judgment closes the game. Wouldn't you know it? Lauren sent someone behind her and turned to see a bearded man with gray eyes standing there. He said, I'm Whiskey Jack. Good morning, adjunct, and welcome to Jerusalem. Whiskey Jack pulled up a chair and sat next to Hedge. He said, you'll want to report, right? Well, we're still trying to contact the Assassin's Guild. All the mining's done, ready for the order. One squad member lost thus far. In other words, we've been damn lucky. There are Tist Andy in the city hunting us. Lorne asked who the squad lost. Whiskey Jack said, the recruit. Sorry was her name. Lorne asked if she was dead, and Whiskey Jack said she'd been missing for a few days. Lorne clenched her teeth to prevent cursing. She asked, so you don't know if she's dead? Whiskey Jack said, no. Is there a problem, adjunct? She was just a recruit. Even if she'd been nabbed by the guard, there's scant little she could tell them. Besides, we've heard no such news. More likely some thugs scrubbed her in some back alley. We've been scurrying down a lot of rat holes trying to find these local assassins. He shrugged and said, it's a risk you live with, that's all. I love how he's not revealing what they really know, only what Lorne thinks they would know. Right. He's so inscrutable. I love that dude. But yeah, just just exactly what she needs to hear and nothing else. <laughs> Lauren said, Asari was a spy. A very good one, Sergeant. You can be certain that no thug killed her. No, she's not dead. She's hiding because she knew I'd come looking for her. I've been on her trail for three years. I want her. Whiskey Jack's voice was tight. He said, if we'd had a hint of all this, it could have been arranged, adjunct, but you kept it to yourself. And that makes you on your own now. Whether we contact the guild or not, we detonate the mines before tomorrow's dawn. And then we're out of here. Lauren sat up straight and said, I am adjunct to the Empress, Sergeant. As of now, this mission's under my direction. You will take orders from me. All this independent crap is over. Understand? Lauren thought she saw a flash of triumph in Whiskey Jack's eyes. But upon closer inspection, she recognized it as the anger she expected. Whiskey Jack curtly said, understood, adjunct. What are your orders? She said, I'm serious in this, sergeant, and I don't care how angry this makes you. Now, I suggest we retire to more private surroundings. She stood up then said, 
Your men can remain here. Whiskey Jack stood and told her they had the back room in the inn and asked her to follow him. Inside the room, Lorne noted the blood on the blanket covering the bed. Whiskey Jack turned and said, One of my men had a brush with a tist and the assassin mage. He'll recover. Lorne said, Highly unlikely, Sergeant. The tist and are all with Caladan brood in the north. Her eyes then widened in disbelief, and she said, You don't mean to suggest that the Lord of Moonspawn himself has left his fortress? To do what? Hunt down Malazan spies? Don't be absurd. This reaction from her is disappointing. It seems arrogant to me that she's not listening to what he's telling her is happening on the ground. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. That's it's an extremely disappointing reaction to have about her. Is, is this is this change due in her due to her visit in the Barrow? I have a suspicion that she has picked up a measure of contempt for him from the Empress. Oh. And that is bleeding through in her interactions with all of the bridge burners. Okay. Okay. But yes, I believe it's, it's extreme arrogance and it's extreme. And it's, well, never mind. I'm not going to say too much, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskey Jack scowled and said, Corporal Kalam and my squad mage had a rooftop engagement with at least half a dozen Tist Andy. That my men survived makes it highly unlikely that the moon's lord was anywhere in the vicinity, doesn't it, adjunct? Put it together. The moon stations itself just south of the city. Its lord strikes in alliance with Darujistan's rulers, and their first task is to wipe out the local assassins' guild. Why? To prevent people like us from contacting them and offering a contract. And, so far, it's worked. Lauren thought for a moment, then asked if the guild couldn't be contacted, why not have Kalam perform the assassinations of the city's rulers? He was counted among the best in the claw before his falling out. Please, tell me more about this falling out. <laughs> People oh, no. aren't supposed to be able to leave the ranks of the claw and live. I know, I know, and it's killing me. I want to know how he got it alive. I have a theory. There's only okay. one theory that works for me. Do you know anything about Jeremiah Johnson? <laughs> The movie's great. Dude, so you know it's based on truth, right? I didn't know that it was based on a true story. It's Liver Eating Johnson. Okay. The real story of Liver Eating Johnson is pretty much as follows. When the crow kills his family, he kills so many of them. He put the fear on them, and they begged peace with him. Wow. And... I mean, I don't know how many he killed, but he killed them and ate, take a big bite out. He cut their liver out and take a bite out of each one of them. And uh, it's wild. It is wild, dude. But he put the fear on him so bad they thought he was they thought he was unkillable because he you know he you couldn't kill that old boy apparently, and he was so so he put the fear on him. So I'm just curious if Kalam just put the fear on the claw, killed enough of them old boys that they're like, you know what, we're you know it's all, we're we're even. <laughs> what kind of man was this guy to be able to take out so many fighting <laughs> men from a, a tribe? Because you have to think those men that he was killing, mm -hmm. they're not slouches no, in no, combat. They're, I, I, I would if think anything, they're, they're better. <laughs> it, it, I would think they're better in nature than he yes. was. So because how the heck the, did he manage all that? Well, he he was trained out in the you know being lost out in the wilderness and surviving in the wilderness will do that to you. He had learned just like they learned to survive. Yeah, so, but he didn't grow up like they. No, did he didn't grow up like they did. But he was also, I believe, he had been in the military though. I believe as okay. part of it probably fought in some of the wars around there, you know, I'm assuming the, some of the Indian wars and whatnot. So that's crazy. He just had, so yeah, but just such a fierce guy. To, I know, I don't know. It's, it's, I read a, I've read a small book about him. It's kind of hard to find out much about him. This was what in the early 1700s or was no, it this, later this would like eight, This is like 18s. This okay. had probably been, this would have probably been closer to like the 1850s. It probably after the, uh, maybe around, bef I'm not sure if it's before or after the civil war, but it's okay. a bit around. I, it, I would imagine that time period ish, 1800s. I think it's more late 1800s though. Okay. The wild west era. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Whiskey Jack crossed his arms and leaned against the wall. He said, okay, this is in response to her question about why Kalam doesn't just take everybody out. <laughs> Whiskey Jack said, we've been considering that adjunct, and we're a step ahead of you. Right now, one of my men is negotiating for us to work as private strong arms for a highbrow fate this evening. Everybody who's anybody is supposed to attend. Council members, high mages, the works. My saboteurs have enough leftover munitions to make it a party this city will have a hard time forgetting. 
Lauren fought a growing sense of frustration since she had intended to take command of the situation, but Whiskey Jack had things in hand. She didn't think she could do better. She still doubted the story about the Tist Andy. <laughs> she just won't let it go. <laughs> no, she won't. And that's part of that's why I wonder what's going on. Is it carrying the finesse or something else? Because she in the past would let all this other stuff roll off her back. Mm -hmm. I would, she wouldn't let contempt for somebody who was under her show unless, you know, unless it was designed to show. It seems more like she's irritated, like a like beyond the normal. Yeah, I don't know. It's really yeah. weird. Very weird. She said, why on earth wouldn't a state hire a bunch of strangers as guards? Whiskey Jack smiled and said, oh, there will be city soldiers there as well, but none of them is a bargast. Titillation factor adjunct. It's what makes the nobility drool. Look there, a big tattooed barbarian glowering down at them. Exciting, yes? He shrugged and said, it's a risk, but one worth taking. Unless, of course, you have a better idea, adjunct. Lorne heard the challenge in his tone. She recognized that if she had considered the circumstances, she would have come to the conclusion long before that her title and power wouldn't intimidate Whiskey Jack. I think that actually answers my question. Sorry. Oh, okay. He'd stood next to Dasim Ultor. What a name. Dasim Every time Ultor. I see it, I just, oh. We need, we almost need like one of those, like, like a little small fanfare, like when the clouds part and the sun shines, that real heavenly, like, oh, you know, every time you say, you know exactly what I'm saying. When I say, when there's the Dasim Ultra reference. It will be so. <laughs> we will make it so in the holy land of our own studio. He stood next to Dasim Ultor and argued tactics when he was the sword of the empire. The demotion to sergeant hadn't broken him, given what she'd heard about the bridge burner's reputation in pale. Whiskey Jack wouldn't hesitate to question every command she gave if there was a valid reason. She said, your plan is sound. Tell me the name of the estate. He said, some woman named Lady Simtal. I don't know the family name, but everybody seems to know her. Said to be a real looker with influence in the council. Lauren said, very well. I'll return in two hours, Sergeant. There are other matters I must attend to. Be certain that all is ready. Detonation procedures included. If you don't get hired, we'll have to find another way of being at that fate. She walked to the door. Whiskey Jack called to her and she turned. He went to the back wall and pulled a tattered hanging to the side. In a condescending tone, he said, this tunnel emerges into another house. From it, you can enter the Daru district. Irritated with his tone, she said, unnecessary, and left. As soon as she was gone, Quick Ben scrambled out of the tunnel and said, damn it, Sergeant, you almost had her walking in on me. Whiskey Jack said, no chance. In fact, I made certain she wouldn't use it. Anything from Kalam? Quick Ben paced and said, not yet, but he's about to run out of patience. This is in reference to him attempting to contact the Assassin's Guild, right? Right. Yeah, okay. yeah, I, I believe so. And also, was uh, was that whole encounter also designed to make her irritated? I think so. <laughs> right, apparently so. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Quickman turned to face Whiskey Jack and said, So, do you think she was fooled? Whiskey Jack laughed and said, Fooled? She was reeling. Quick Ben said, Parents said she was going to drop something off. Did she? Whiskey Jack said, not yet. Quick Ben said, it's getting tight, Sergeant. Damn tight. The door to the room opened and Trotz entered. His filed teeth bared in something between a smile and a grimace. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskey Jack asked, success? Trotz nodded. Witness! I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was okay. waiting for it. Yeah. <laughs> We are just on the edge of things kicking off here. It's so close. Yes. Oh, and I know, and I get so antsy and excited about this part because I'm, I think we said it at the end of last episode, and I, I'm going to ask the question again, but for the most part, doesn't the last whole bit of this take place in this next basically 12-hour, 16-hour window on this in the book? I think so, but I'm beginning to be surprised with all the little details that I've forgotten like yeah. one of the ones about to come up right here. <laughs> oh, right. So, yeah, uh, I think so. But the, there may be after, uh, let's just, we'll get there. You yeah, know, okay. it's coming. Yeah. <clears throat> Crocus and Absalar spent the afternoon in Kroll's Belfry, periodically looking over the edge at the festivities below. They could sense the flavor of mania among the crowds as if they were on the cusp of desperation. The shadow of the Malazan Empire hung over all, and with Moonspawn to the south, the city's place between the two was obvious to everyone. 
Crocus noted that Daruja's stand somehow felt smaller and more insignificant. His view of the world has expanded. Prior to this, all he knew was Darusha Stan. That's right. Yeah, he's uh, had a big adventure outside of town, and uh, and just and is now realizing how, how much more a big wide world he has out there. Right. The forces from the outside are also kind of expanding his view. Right. He's yes. realizing there's more than just the the thieves guild. Yeah. <laughs> and the assassins guild, and those guys are bit players in in this thing. The guild, the local guilds. <laughs> Are mm, only local, yeah. you know. <laughs> mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. Big fish, little pond type scenario. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it was. It's, he's now aware that there's such a thing as international intrigue. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I guess it's the better <laughs> way. It's like, oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Apslar told him the city looked huge, one of the largest she had seen, perhaps even as large as Unta. He stared at her and thought she'd been making strange comments lately, comments that shouldn't have come from a young girl. He said, Unta, that's the Empire capital, isn't it? She frowned and said, yes, only I've never been there. He asked how she could know its size. She told him she wasn't sure. Crocus thought about Call claiming she had been possessed. Two sets of memories were warring with each other, and it was getting worse. He sat down and stared at the assassin's body across from him. A trail of blood crossed the floor to the stairs, indicating the assassin's killer had been wounded. Somehow Crocus didn't feel in danger within the tower. He wasn't sure why. And that's a good question. Yeah, it is a very good question. I'd be yeah. very nervous. Yeah, I mean, the body, when they got there, the blood was still wet. Yeah, so, running down the steps. Yeah. So there's, yeah, there's all kinds of reasons to be on your, be on edge. Mm-hmm. He thought, for an abandoned belfry tower, this place had witnessed a lot of drama lately. <laughs> Absalar asked if they were waiting for nighttime. Crocus nodded. She then asked if they would then find Chalice. Crocus said, that's right. The Darls will be at Lady Simtal's fate. I'm sure of it. The estate has an enormous garden, almost a forest. It goes right up to the back wall. Getting in should be easy. Absalar asked if Crocus would stick out amongst the guests. Crocus said, I'll be dressed as a thief. Everybody will be wearing costumes. Besides, there will be hundreds of people there. It might take an hour or two, but I'll find her. Apsilar asked what came next. Crocus told her he'd think of something. Apsilar said, and I'm supposed to hide in the bushes, huh? Crocus shrugged and said, maybe Uncle Mamet will be there. Then everything will be all right. She asked why. Exasperated, Crocus said, because that's what Call said. (laughs) <laughs> he wasn't sure if he should tell her of her possession. He went on, we'll work out a way to get you home. That's what you want, right? She nodded slowly as if she was no longer certain. She said, I miss my father. Crocus thought she sounded as if she was trying to convince herself. Except for all the questions, Crocus had to admit that her company wasn't bad. He did note that if he'd been in her situation, he wasn't sure if he'd hold up as well as she was given the circumstances. Apslar was watching him. She said, I'm feeling all right. It's as if something inside is keeping things together. I can't explain it any better, but it's like a smooth black stone, solid and warm. And whenever I start getting scared, it takes me inside and then everything's fine again. And that's Riga. When she put herself in there, that's what she's talking about. Okay. Yeah. So that's taking us way back to the beginning of the book. Yes. Wow. Wow. Apslar added, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to push you away. He said, never mind. What is she talking about pushing him away? By saying she wanted to leave Darujistan? How are you interpreting that? I, I don't know. Is, is, is she not sharing enough of her internal feelings? Is that what she means? I didn't see any outward indication in this conversation that she had responded to any advances from him or rejected yeah. him in any way. The only thing no. I could see was... When he asked if she wanted to go home, and she said yes. Yeah, I mean that's maybe that's maybe that's it. Maybe that hurt him more than I read into that. Okay. Surat was hidden in the stairwell within Kroll's tower. She studied the two figures on the platform. She decided enough was enough and opened her warren and layered some defensive wards around her. She thought no more of these invisible enemies. If they wanted her, they'd have to show themselves, and then she'd kill them. She unsheathed her daggers and prepared for her attack. There were a dozen wards at her back all along the staircase, making an approach from that direction impossible. 
Suddenly, Surratt felt two sharp points as they touched her <laughs> under the chin and beneath her left shoulder blade. She froze. <laughs> a whisper from a voice she recognized was audible in her ear. Give Rake this warning, Surratt. He'll only get one, and the same for you. The coin bearer shall not be harmed. The games are done. Try this again, and you'll die. Surratt said, You bastard! My lord's anger, the voice interrupted, will be in vain. We both know who sends this message, don't we? And, as Rake well knows, he's not as far away as he once was. The point beneath her chin was removed, which allowed Surratt to nod. It returned. The voice said, Good. Deliver the message, then, and hope we don't meet again. Surratt shook with rage and said, This will not be forgotten. She heard a low chuckle, then, Compliments of the prince, Surratt. Take it up with our mutual friend. The daggers left her flesh, and Surratt slowly exhaled, then sheathed her weapons. She snapped a spell and vanished. All right, let's talk about this. Okay. First, I'd like to give credit to Livia the Malazan Potato Noob, who left a comment on. on YouTube earlier, not last episode, but the one before that, okay. about the invisible hand that had slammed into Surratt the last time. That was the Crimson Guard she seemed to oh. remember. Okay. And I had completely forgotten about this little section here. The comment, compliments of the prince, is referring to Prince Kaz Devor, the okay. commander of the Crimson Guard. And okay. then the mutual friend that is referred to is Caladan Brood. Ooh. Now, remember, Caladan Brood had wanted to meet with Prince Kaz to request the services of the Sixth Blade. That was when he was talking to Kalor in his camp, the one time that we've seen Caladan Brood. I think okay. it was, we either saw him once or twice, but in one of those encounters, he specifically said he wanted to get the services of the sixth blade. Okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Dude, nice. Thanks, Olivia. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. What's interesting is you get one sentence here to tie that together. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <it's>, Which <laughs> I apparently did not ever yeah, have I, never done in my I honestly it, so. don't remember the Crimson Guard coming in to save Krogus. Like, so. Yeah. I, I, I don't yeah. I don't either. <laughs> With everything else that's going on in this chapter, I was probably just blazing through it at this point because, you know, everything's coming to a head. Yes. Yes. Kind of makes sense. Love it. Crocus jumped at the faint plopping sound that came from the stairwell. His hands went to his knives and he tensed. Absalar asked what was wrong. He shushed her and asked her to wait. After a moment, he said, I'm ducking at shadows. Well, we're off soon anyway. Welcome to Inside the Mind of a Malazan Killer. <laughs> this week, we delve into the twisted mind of the Jaghut tyrant, Raced. I'm your host, Comrade. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I look forward. <laughs> <laughs> it was an age of wind whose thirst assailed all life, mindless and unrelenting. Struggling in his mother's wake, the wind was Raced's first lesson in power. In the hunt for domination that would shape his life, it was the ways of the wind that he found the closest to his heart. His mother had been the first to flee his shaping of power. She had been broken performing the ritual of the sundering of blood which cut him free. He thought her being broken had been unimportant since he who would dominate must learn early that those resisting his command should be destroyed. Failure was her price, not his. He's a cold-blooded little whelp, eh? Rotten mm. to the core from childhood. Right. Yes, vicious little sociopath. <laughs> yeah. Goodness. The Jaghut feared community, pronouncing society to be the birthplace of tyranny and citing their own bloody history as proof. Race found a hunger for it, since the power he commanded meant he needed subjects. He couldn't dominate without the company of the dominated. Now, I have to do this, okay, Billy? Okay. I'm going to give you a quote. I want to tell you what comes to mind. Okay. Don't reason with it. Don't argue with it. Just dominate it. <laughs> Do you know what that's from? Hold on. I'm begging. Is, is that, is that, is that, an, is that the episode? Yes. Is, uh, <laughs> it's a South, of, Park, of South reference. Park reference. Yeah. yeah that's Caesar <laughs> Milan. <laughs> Caesar Milan. <laughs> Talking about. That, that's the episode where they brought the dog whisperer in yes. to, to teach Cartman because he Cartman drove all the other nannies crazy. Insane. Yeah. Yes. Insane. Yeah, but as soon wow. as, whenever I see that I'm word dominate. Familiar. Yes, I'm too familiar. I, I uh I think of that quote. It's just, it's just when you said it, up. I'm like, oh my good gracious, yes, that's fantastic. <laughs> 
wouldn't you love to see the South Park version of this? It'd be bloody. Because I, they have some great bloody episodes sometimes. Um, yeah. Man, it'd be great. I would love it'd to be see it. I think I mean, they did a Game of Thrones one, right? So I'm assuming it'd be similar. Yes. Yeah. Did they Thrones do a Game of Thrones blood. one? I thought yes. they did, didn't they? Okay. Yes, yeah. it's, it's a three-parter. Yeah. It leads up to the game Stick of Truth that you don't have oh, to play, okay. right, but you can right, play right. it. It makes several insults to people pre-buying the game, like myself. I don't usually pre-buy games, but it was South Park, so I did. But it's mm-hmm. it's yeah it's magical. It's insulting to Black Friday and to everything. South Park mm-hmm. they insult everybody equally. They, yeah. they hate everybody, including themselves equally. I love it. Nice. At first, race sought to subjugate other Jag Hut, but they either escaped him or he had to kill them. These only gave him momentary satisfaction. He then tried to subjugate beasts, but they died in bondage, finding escape that he could not control. In his anger, he laid waste to the land and drove countless species into extinction. The earth resisted him, and its power was immense but unfocused. Thus, it was unable to overwhelm him. His power was focused and precise in its destruction. Then the first of the eye mass crossed his path. They struggled against his will, defying slavery and living on. They were filled with boundless, pitiful hope. In them, Raced had found the glory of domination, for with each eye mass that broke, he took another. Raced fashioned a type of society that was bereft of cities, yet was plagued with the drama of society. The community of enslaved eye mass managed to convince themselves that they possessed freedom. They ran in endless circles and called it growth, emergence, knowledge. The whole time, Raced flexed his will, invisible to them all. His greatest joy came when they proclaimed him God and constructed temples to serve him. They organized priesthoods whose activities mimicked race tyranny with such cosmic irony that the Jaghut could only shake his head. The empire should have lasted for millennia. Race had never imagined that the other Jaghut would find his activities abhorrent and they would risk themselves on behalf of the short-lived Imas. What astonished him the most was that they came in numbers in community a community whose sole purpose of existence was to destroy his empire, to imprison him. He had been unprepared. The lesson had been learned. No matter how the world had changed, race was ready for it. So, wow. First off, wow. Um, but is, is he so powerful? Is he, I, This is where I sometimes get confused in the series. Like these ascendants versus gods. Would you consider this guy like an ascendant? Yes. Because he's close to be he's being worshipped at some point by the IMS. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if that constitutes or, you know, I don't know if that necessarily constitutes what it takes to be an ascendant or a deity. Well, it think of it this way. To... When we talk about gods, their power seems to be derived from the number of worshippers that they have. Okay. Right. Whereas race power seems to be part of him. Yes. And I, that's what I, is that how it is for all Jaghut? Are all Jaghut inherently powerful, but this he was more powerful than the normal? That's a good question because then what do you do with Hood? Yeah. And Gothos. Well, Gothos isn't really worshipped, right? I'm just saying oh, Hood oh, oh, is oh. the, yes. I guess he'd be the king of High House Death, right? Yes, yes. And, and so he has worshippers, but he is also a Jaghut. Yes. And he doesn't, he's, we, he's also a deity that doesn't need worshipers because death is a natural part of life and he just gets things anyhow. <laughs> doesn't he? Right, right. And that's the one bonus, I guess, the God of death in this world would be one of the most powerful mm-hmm. and somebody else who we haven't introduced yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But maybe there's a little bit of overlap. Maybe, maybe you could be both. Yeah. I'm just. I was just kind of curious. What, because uh, or is is he still beneath the level of some other folks? Like, did he not rise to, like, Rake's worthiness of notice? Because I'm assuming Rake was probably alive at this point and was like, meh. <laughs> hmm. You know, is it that? Is it like that beneath his notice? Or you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of curious. I, I, I'm curious. I'm power level curious. Yeah. You know, kind of like Hulk, Spider Man. What kind of levels are we looking at here? You know. <laughs> Well, I think we're at obscene power levels that are hard to really yeah. kind of figure out because realistically, Rake himself said that it was going to take him and the Tistandi to try to weaken race yeah. enough for the Cabal to stop him. Well, that's true. So that's so that does put race at a very strong level of power then. 
Yeah. And this is him newly awakened. Imagine him in his fullest. Pretty scary. In his like prime. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Very cool. Thank you. That's very nicely. Yeah. Very nicely shown. Thank but, you. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm right. It's just how I process it. I, 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 that's a good way to process it. Thank you. It's it's good to talk through. So yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we are taking, <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, all right. <laughs> no, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> move along, move along. We're, yeah. We're taking the present time. It had taken race some time to dig himself free of the barrow. The effort had incapacitated him for a time, but he was now ready to walk free. He sensed the others had come and prepared the way for him, disarming the Omtos Falak wards and seals. His first priority was to gather his finest, for much of his power had been stored within the seed. He felt the absence of Omtos Falak in the world above and thought nothing was there to oppose him now. His withered, cracked face twisted into a savage grin. His lower tusks split the desiccated skin. He sloshed through the slush that now covered the barrow floor. He approached the wall that marked the tomb's barrier and made a gesture. It exploded outward and bright sunlight flared in the clouds of steam rolling around him. He felt the waves of cold, ancient air sweeping past him, then walked into the light. Mm -hmm. Crone rode the the wind high above. Jeez, oh, I can't. <laughs> Crone rode the wind high above the Gadrobi Hills. She cackled when the burst of power launched tons of earth and rocks a hundred feet into the sky. She dipped a wing and banked toward the white pillar of steam. She cackled and thought this should prove interesting. Suddenly, air pounded down onto her. She shrieked in outrage and twisted along the wind. Massive shadows flowed over her. Her anger was replaced by a surge of excitement. She beat the air to gain altitude. In matters such as these, a proper point of view was essential. From her new vantage point, she looked down to find the light of the sun reflecting off the ridged backs of five dragons. Four were black, but one shone like fire. I need to make a correction here. A couple of episodes ago, when Crocus saw the five shadows leave Moonspawn, I said it was five black dragons parroting what Call had said mm -hmm. to Crocus in the bar. One of them is red. So, okay. correction there. Crone felt their sorceress power as it bled in ripples from the web of their spread wings. They sailed silently, moving toward the dust cloud above the Jaghut tomb. Crone's eyes fixed on the red dragon in the lead, and she yelled, Solana, Dragna Purek Tana Draconius Elaint, Elaint. <laughs> I'm not sure what the literal translation of this is, or if I even said that right, but I want to point out that Elaint are dragons. So she's yep. yelling something about Solana being a dragon. She seems pretty excited. That's a good thing. She, yeah, she's getting fired up. She's probably like saying, man, the queen of dragons or something like that. Or mm, Yeah. Now, one thing I did find interesting was Crone can see the sorcery emanating like webs coming out of their wings. Right. I thought they were actively flying, and to some extent they are, but I guess they're also sorcerously propelling themselves. I think that's kind of the all I believe that is to be the general rule of thumb in dragons is that it's not necessary they're not capable of sustaining themselves through true flight. Like, yes, they kind of do, but I thought a lot of it was sorcery assisted. Okay. That's just kind of, I don't know why I've always assumed that, but this really spells it out for me. So that's how I, that's how I read it with these folks. Yes. They, they flap their wings and look scary and impressive because they are scary and they are impressive, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know. It may be easier for them to, maybe they can fly. I'm not really sure, but I've always kind of felt it was that way more sorceress. Yeah. It's, I think it's because dragons are generally pretty heavy set compared to like a Drake, right? Where yeah. I could see a Drake having a easier time flying than a dragon. Yes. Like, especially like when they're younger, they, you know, because in the Drake, it's basically like a young and like no. Or... Okay. So a dragon has four legs, okay. right? And then it has wings where a Drake, the front legs are the wings. Oh, and, and, uh, they have really big back legs. So they're kind of like a T-Rex walking around, but then okay. I guess they'd be closer to a pterodactyl. Right. And right. Th so there's less body mass and more wing in proportion to a dragon. So that's what, what I meant by that is I could right. see them not requiring the sorceress. Well, you know, th th yeah, you're probably right. Cause they probably hollow boned things like things. if they got wings, I'm sure that there's some made to fly, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. to nat I'm sure they could naturally fly. It would be kind of pointless. Okay. Wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about fantasy, Billy, and we're, we're trying to make it, makes sense in the realm of right, reality right right <laughs> sorry 
This is true. All right. Move along, man. All right. What is the purpose of this show? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Race walked out into the afternoon sunlight. He noted the yellow grassed hills rising in every direction but the one he faced. To the east stretched an empty plain. He grunted and thought, not so different after all. He raised his arms to his sides and quested out with his power. He exulted in the waves of fear coming from the mindless life around him. He sensed no signs of higher life near him, so instead he quested downwards to find the sleeping goddess who was young as far as he was concerned. Race whispered, shall I wake you? Not yet, but I shall make you bleed. His right hand closed into a fist. The goddess was speared with pain, which drove a fissure through the bedrock. The line of hills to the north lifted skyward. Magma sprayed into the air. The earth shuddered as the sound of the eruption swept over him. He smiled and studied the shattered ridge, then breathed the sulfurous air as it swept over him. He turned to face the west and strode toward the highest hill there. The finis was a three-day walk beyond the hill. He considered opening his warren, then decided to wait until he reached the summit of the hill where he could better judge the position of the finis. Halfway up the slope, he heard distant laughter. He stiffened as the sky suddenly darkened around him. Five enormous shadows swept up the slope in front of him. He looked to the sky and saw five dragons as they banked in perfect formation. Their heads watched him as they glided back in his direction. Can you imagine seeing this on screen? Dude, you yes. Could do... <laughs> yes, I Man, would it'd be so sick. Yes. <laughs> just the, the, I could see a slow motion panning shot with the dragons yeah. just like eyeballing him as they're coming yeah. around. Blue oh, angel man. style. You know, <laughs> wingtip to wingtip. You know exactly yeah, what I'm talking about. It's so sick. Yeah. Four of the dragons were black, led by a fifth red dragon, twice the size of the others. The black dragons numbered two on each side of the lead dragon. This is the first time we've heard just how large Solana is compared to the other dragons. Yeah, she's huge. Yeah. Race's eyes narrowed and he muttered, Solana Red Wings, elder born and true blooded Tiam. You lead Soul Taken, whose blood is alien to this world. I feel you all. From this statement, we can gather Solana is a true-born dragon, and the four black dragons that accompany her are Tistandi that can shapeshift into dragons. And remember, Soul Taken indicates someone can shapeshift into a single entity. Yes. Raced raised his fist to the sky and yelled, Colder than the ice born of Jaghut hands, as dark as blindness, I feel you. He lowered his arms and said, Harass me not, Elaine. I cannot enslave you, but I will destroy you. Know that. I will drive you to the ground, each and all, and with my own hands I shall tear your hearts from your chests. Soul taken. You would challenge me at the command of another. You would battle with me for no reason of your own. Ah, but if I were to command you, I would not throw your lives away so carelessly. I would cherish you, soul taken. I would give you causes worth believing in show you the true rewards of power. Race felt their derision at his proposal and scowled. He said, so be it. They passed over him in silence, and he raised his arms out to the sides, then unleashed his warren. His flesh split as power flowed into him. His arms shed skin like ash. This description of what is happening to him as he's mm -hmm. unleashing his power, it's wild that he has so little regard for his own body is he just able to and i know that is it because he's able to heal himself it never i don't think it ever really specifically covers this but i'm assuming because his body means nothing to him i don't know but i mean you have to think it hurts like crazy he would i would think so and then when tattersell is talking about if you dive too far into your warren it's gonna consume you i would think the same thing would happen to him it might very well but at the same time he might come out of the warren hmm <laughs> You, I mean, he's one of those kind of people that you just don't know with, with his kind yeah. of willpower. It's a willpower thing. And this guy seems very strong-willed. Mm -hmm. Race felt and heard the hills crack all around him. To all sides, the horizon blurred as dust billowed skyward. He yelled, this is my power. Come to me. A long minute passed. Then he cried out and whirled to his right just as the dragons plunged over the summit of the hill he'd been climbing. Race screamed at the whirlwind of power that battered him. His eyes locked with Solana's black, empty, deadly gaze, eyes as large as his head. 
She bore down on him with the speed of a springing viper. Her jaws opened wide and Raced found himself staring down the beast's throat. He screamed a second time and released his power all at once. The air detonated as their warrens collided. Starvald Demolane and Curald Galane warred with Omtos Falak in a savage maelstrom of will. Grasses, earth, and rock withered to fine ash on all sides, and within the vortex stood Raced, his power roaring from him. Lashes of sorcery from the dragons lanced into his body, boring through his withered flesh. Quick reminder of what all these warrens are. Because I remember specifically being super confused right. <laughs> the first time I was reading through this. Right. I'm like, what does all this mean? Starval Demolane is the Warren of Dragons, almost pure chaos. Kurald Galane is the Warren of True Darkness, wielded by the Teast Andy. And Omtos Falak is the Jaghut Warren, largely associated with ice. We had previously discussed like power on power and how it works and i was kind of curious he's here he specifically and if if it's between two powerhouses like this i'm assuming it's will on will because mm -hmm. <laughs> he mentions the of the savage maelstrom of will so i think i guess it's probably who is the strongest will is the winner and in, in things like that or who's willing to go the deepest into their power reserves yeah and, we, and he has no he has no hesitation Mm -hmm. You know, no hesitation in hurting himself to do so. He didn't yeah. seem bothered. He didn't seem bothered or hurt by it even. Yeah. It's like he has no limit. Yeah. He's not looking at going back from this. Yes. And the other people probably don't want to die. Yeah. It's forward. It's forward just to dominate everything. It's, it's all he knows how to do. He just wants to dominate it. Don't reason with it. Don't <laughs> argue with it. <laughs> Dominate. Just dominate. Just dominate it. it. Oh, that's too funny. So true. That, that's, that seems to be he. That, that is his thing. There's, you know what? There's only one other person like him in this series, isn't there? Who else has got the Carson. Such a nasty... Carson. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. I think he's the only. I think his will. I don't know whose will would be. I think his will would be stronger. Carson, than man. Race. Carson. Carson, Carson, baby. Carson. It's Carson. Yeah. <laughs> witness yes success you yes just dude he is the man yeah. mm -hmm. or the giant right. whatever i love that dude <laughs> such a hateful oh yeah race flayed his power like a scythe which caused blood to spatter the ground as it sprayed in gouts the dragon shrieked a wave of incandescent fire struck race from the right solid as a battering fist he flew through the air and landed in a bank of powdery ash Solana's fire raced over him, blackening what was left of his flesh. He clambered upright, his body jerking uncontrollably as sorcery gouted from his right hand. The ground shook as his power hammered Solana down. She skidded and tumbled across the slope. Race's exultant roar was cut short as Talon's the length of a forearm crunched into him from behind. A second clawed foot joined the first, snapping through the bones of Race's chest as if they were twigs. More talons flexed around him as a second dragon sought grip. He twisted helpless as the claws lifted him into the air and started ripping his body apart. He dislocated his own shoulder in reaching round to dig his fingers into a sleek, scaled shin. Upon contact, Omtos Phylact surged into the dragon's leg, shattering bone, boiling blood. Race laughed as the claws spasmed loose and he was flung away. More bones snapped as he struck the ground, but it did not matter. His power was absolute. The vessel that carried it had little relevance. If need be, he would find other bodies, bodies in the thousands. He climbed to his feet and whispered, Now I deliver death. And thus the chapter ends. Now Man. we're off to the races. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. We're there. We're yeah. there. Ooh. For standout moments, Fiddler's Card Game. It's always hard to follow these, but they are entertaining nonetheless. Oh, I know, I know. I love them and am equally confused by them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Crimson Guard getting the best of Surratt yet again. I still feel bad for her. You know, finding out that it was indeed the Crimson Guard in, is in and of itself really cool. Yes. And how the, you know, I, that's just awesome. Learning about race background in our interview with the serial killer series. The, yes. <laughs> whatever you want to call yes. it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, the, the, I think the only greatest killer, mass killer in history, I'm sorry, in fantasy history would be Thanos, who has wiped mm -hmm. out half of creation. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so other than that, I think he probably outdoes. That's, no one can uh, race is the man. Race is awesome. He's crazy. He, oh, I love that crazy. scene with the yeah. dragons. Oh, oh yeah. His, his disregard for his body that explains a lot. Talking about using other bodies. Mm-hmm. So so he'll just he don't care. He'll just jump and make it into his new home. I guess so. But I mean, he's still in a jag hut body right now. So that's what makes it weird to me. He's hundreds of millennia old, yeah. yet he's still in his original body, but he's just willing to discard it so flippantly. It just seems maybe, odd to me. Maybe he can make the new home into what he wants. Okay, that's that's pretty wild. Can reshape he's the like flesh. He's like a T-1000. Yeah. <laughs> T- yeah. Is that the T-2000? Or is it the 1000? No, T-1000 from Terminator 2, right? Yes. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Seeing race power as he made the Earth rupture, that was pretty wild. Dude. Well, more yeah, specifically, just... he didn't make the Earth rupture. He hurt Burn, yes. the sleeping goddess, and then she made the Earth rupture. Yes. Yeah. That's nasty. Mm-hmm. It's nasty. The dragons flying in formation was really cool. I like seeing that. Yes. Uh, yeah, the blue, I, 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 I could just imagine the blue angels for some reason or some group, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Thunderbirds, whatever, yes, fly, yeah. flying mm-hmm. over in tight formation, like, you know, like an inch off each other's wing mm-hmm. and just looking really impressive. But the fact that he's just able to stand up to him, good gracious. I yeah. Mean, Talk about just, power level. Yeah. Power levels. Five on one and he's putting it to him. Yeah, he is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, seeing Solana for the first time was cool. And then also, cause we've heard about her before, but actually seeing her described and then her size in comparison to the other ones. Yeah. Really impressive. Yeah, I mean, I'm like you. The size was escaped me that she'd be twice the size of, because I imagine that the other fellows are what I would imagine were just regular size dragons. Yes. And and mm-hmm. she is, in fact, twice their size. <laughs> She's a real dragon, and they're yes. kind of fake true. dragons. She, yeah. <laughs> they're posers. Yeah. I would never call them that to their face, but yes. No. <laughs> and then the description of Omtos Falak boiling the blood and shattering the bone of that dragon leg, that was pretty wild too, right? Seeing yes. the effects of it when he did that, because that just leaves a particular image in my mind. Yes. It, it, the way he's just able to just hurt them and the way that he gets bit into is i mean like he's got these talons and stuff shredding him and he's not even really troubled by it it's like i'm just going to reach out and touch their talon and it just boils their blood the fact that he just keeps it together yeah he's you know, is, being he's been impaled by multiple talons he's being ripped apart and he still is able to do that cool but man great it's, it's getting good. wild yeah it, yes. it's kicking off from here on so, out it's, yeah. it's accelerating yeah it's kind of pedal to the metal for the majority of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least I feel that it is. If I, if it, I keep forgetting so much stuff too at this point because there's so much going on. There's so many threads, and there's threads I forgot that were you know there, there's there threads I forgot that were even there. Yeah. All right. Well, great job tonight. Yeah, a great episode, man. Yeah, I'd like to leave everybody with just a, a final message for you to think about. Don't reason with it. Don't argue with it. <laughs> just dominate it. Dominate it. <laughs> We'll see you next week. See you next week, folks. (laughs) We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.